Well, good morning again. Wearing the multiple hats around here, you get to be the one that says good morning more than once. Uh, yeah, as we've all said before, it is, it is very important, as Frank was just saying, that we remain in the Word, especially in times like this, because as I've tried to always explain back in the days when I was in youth ministry um, to the kids, I would, I would tell them, and, and I still try to tell the kids in, in the Lord nowadays, whether they're 80 or 90 or, or 10 or 12 or whatever, it doesn't matter, we're all his kids, right? But as I try to say that, reading his word is half the communication with God. You cannot have a full conversation, complete conversation with the Lord and expect everything to hear back from him and everything if, uh, if you're not in his word. Because that is where he is going to talk with us uh, and speak back to us. Believe me, through the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit will speak to us in our hearts. He does. He does that often. Uh, nudges and little guidance as we go. But he also speaks through his word very powerfully on multiple levels. As we're in there reading it, he's speaking to us and he then like puts another flavor on flavor of it. You know, I kind of think of myself, you know, I, I think of it myself kind of like you do with with uh, digital information. And I know this might, some people may, may, may not get this, but you know, when they, when they send multiple signals across one wire, right? You probably didn't know they could do that. You probably thought a signal going on one wire, that wire can only be used for one thing at a time, right? But no, there, there's ways of making, a, 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 over one piece of wire, multiple signals hit it at the same time. And the way they do that is by different frequencies. The receiver on the other end is ready to receive different frequencies of signal, right? So I kind of liken the Word of God to a very, very complex uh, telecommunications device that speaks to you on multiple frequencies. That same sentence in the Word of God can go out one sentence as if one wire going through over the lines, right? But by the different frequencies that, are, that he uses to speak to different people and our receptors in our spirit receive different frequencies at different times. And one person might be spoken to one way through it and another might be spoken to a different way through it, but yet they're both correct. They're just different angles. Right? You see what I'm saying? And neither, none of, if, if it is correct, it will not depart from the Word of God and the, the overall message that we are receiving. Because remember, 66 books, one integrated message system that is extraterrestrial in its origin. Right? For those sci fi buffs like me, you can remember that the Word of God is extraterrestrial in its origins. All right, so now I know we're, we're having a little bit of difficulty with our audio and our technical stuff right now. And it's funny that I would be talking about tech stuff um, when, when we're, uh, a lot of it's being messed with right now. And maybe you hear it, maybe you don't. I hope that you're hearing it's okay. Um, I don't know why this isn't coming through so much in the room, but as so long as it's getting through enough to where everyone can hear, we'll, we'll deal with that. Uh, anyway, this particular passage that we're going to go over today is so important that the enemy would try to keep it from reaching the ears and the hearts of people. Uh, it's, it's that important. Now, I know all of the Word of God is that important, but what I'm saying is by the last phrase in this chapter, we know that there's a purpose behind these verses we're going to study today. And it's for the encouragement of the saints. Now, as I said before, and I, and I tried to bring this up before, that the people in Thessalonica were, as, as the word came to Paul, they were a little worried because some had gone in among them and started teaching them errant things about the word of God and about the end times and how things would unfold and tried to tell them that the resurrection had already occurred. 
and they had pretty much missed it. And they were, in fact, probably at that time living in the day of the Lord, which they knew to be the day of the Lord, be the time of God's wrath being poured out on the world, right? And so Paul, in order to fix that bad teaching, he writes this section in here to correct wrong teaching. And he says, I, I write you these things so that you might not be so worried about those who have fallen asleep, who have gone on to be with the Lord, right? And so he's teaching them these things in this. And, and we'll see it as it unfolds here. Um, but uh, follow with me as, as we do this. Uh, just remember, we're going to learn about the second resurrection. And why do I call it the second resurrection? Because Jesus was the first resurrection. He's the first fruits, right? And some people were resurrected out of the graves in Jerusalem when that happened because it was just too powerful a thing for it to keep some of them in the ground. <laughs> you know, it was like, come forth, you know. I, that's why we always kind of jokingly say when Jesus told Lazarus to come forth out of the grave, he called him by name, otherwise all the rest of them would have came out too. Right? Because that's how powerful he is. But anyway, that's kind of kind of said tongue in cheek, kind of jokingly, like, but I'm not so sure it's a real joke, <laughs> you know. But anyway, when Jesus resurrected from the, the grave, uh, the gospel tells us that there were others that came out of the grave at the same time. Other people were resurrected at that point in time. It was that powerful of a thing. We, as we talked before, don't really know if those people somehow then ascended to be with the Lord or they had to die again like Lazarus did. You know, because it is appointed to man once to die. But if God needs to uh, intervene and do something a little different to, to make a point, he's free to do that. It's his world after all, right? And, and it's appointed to man once to die. Unless God decides to do something different. That's the difference, right? Then someone might be resurrected and then they might even die later again. You know, so they might have had to die more than once, but that's all right. So let's not take those kinds of phrases uh, too, too critically letter of the law dogmatically, you know, like you can only die once, you know. Well, most of us, that is the case. That is the truth. But anyway, we're going to learn about the second resurrection event and the catching up of both those who are resurrected and those who hadn't died yet and are living at the time when it happened. Uh, together caught up to meet the Lord in the air. That's what we're going to see today. This is an event we, the church has nicknamed the rapture. The word rapture, as I've said before, comes from the Latin word for caught up or taken, uh, which is the raptural word, you know, um, and in the Greek that this was written, the word harpazo was used. But they mean the same thing in our English Bibles. It says caught up. Uh, or more literally could be taken or taken up. So snatched is another phrase that's been used for this, snatched away. And that one fits with the, the, the wording, um, the definition as well. So I kind of like that, snatched away, you know. But anyway, let's, let's pick up verse 13 and 14 now. Brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope for we believe that Jesus died and rose again and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him okay we're getting a little mixture of events within the major event at the end of the days, at the end of time for this world, and I might say for this world to be governed by mankind, right? Man's had enough time to govern the earth, to be the one that is responsible for the whole world. Mankind has had this many years. I liken it to the six day principle. So, if, you know, I, I kind of, in my own little theory, you don't have to buy it if you, if, if you don't want to. Uh, I know that the a day is like a thousand years to the Lord, a thousand years are like a day. And I know that was just meaning time doesn't exist for him unless he wants it to. Time doesn't matter for God because he created time. He's not subject to it, okay? And I know that that's what that means, but why did he use a thousand years 
and a thousand years is as a day, unless it was also a hint to us for something else. So personally, I kind of think that that thousand years and a day is something that God might be giving us a hint to as man's dominion over the earth. You see, man was put on this earth and given six days to toil, and on the seventh he'll rest, right? So if it works out to be a thousand years each day like that, and, and you, you, some of you are falling, some of you are going to roll in your eyes like, oh, here he goes. You know, my theory, you don't have to do anything with it if you don't want. It's, it's worth whatever it's worth to you. But my little theory is I kind of think mankind has been given the 6,000 years to have dominion over this earth. And the Lord is going to come back and he's going to rule for a thousand years. That's that thousand year millennial reign of Christ on the earth. He's going to show us how it should have been done, basically. You know, man, man had the time. Wow, what's happening now? All of a sudden, I'm echoing off the back wall. <laughs> but uh, mankind has had plenty of time to try to do it right, but sin crept in, got messed up, and, and everything. And creation groans in anticipation for its deliverance from mankind's dominion that they've messed up we've messed up all right don't be thinking we're going to fix the earth we're not going to you know we're using it we've been told to have dominion and it's for us it's for our purposes god isn't going to let us do anything to it that he doesn't allow right okay and so so as far as oh we're ruining the the water's coming up all these you know these trends might be true but it's all part of god's plan you know, whether, whether the global warming is a real thing or not, I think it's cyclical myself. I don't think it's a trend that's always going that direction. But if it is, and I could be wrong on that, if it is, it's something he planned and has control of. If the oceans are rising, God planned for that, and he's got a reason for it. He's going to use it. He, this, this world has a shelf life. It only has so much time anyway. So we can't be expecting that, oh, we got to make sure it's around for the next 10 billion years. It's not going to be. <laughs> That's not going to happen. It, it had a shelf life. It had a purpose, a time for everything under the heavens. All right, so anyway, um, what we see in this here, I don't want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind. This section here, is, it's anticipating something to come. Hopefully, with hope. We don't want you to grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. I've used this verse in, at funeral services. You know, when, when a Christian person passes away, we don't grieve for them like those who have no hope. Now, if you're one that has no hope, you're probably going to grieve that way. If you don't have the hope of the resurrection and the hope of being reunited with our Lord, united with Him forever, then maybe you don't have hope. And maybe you need to look into that and find out what it's going to take so that you can have that hope as well. But the thing is, those of us who have it, we have the assurance of salvation. We have the knowledge that our salvation is already true. We are standing in it. But that's in the present tense and the past tense we've been saved from the penalty of our sin but there is a present tense to our salvation as well we will be saved from the very presence of sin and for the from the corruption of this world we will be saved from that someday that's our big hope and it's the time when we're united with the lord forever to be with him from that time those who pass on who pass away from this world have stepped across that threshold and are now in that day with him. I believe a time warp occurred. Kind of like stepping through a time portal in those sci-fi movies, you know, where you step across. And I believe that when we step through death's door, we step through to, to the great resurrection day. I don't think that those souls knew a difference of the time that was there. Because remember, God isn't subject to time. He made it. He created it. So that's my theory. You don't have to do anything with that one. You don't have to say that, oh, he says that that's the exact, the way it is. No, I'm putting it out there as a theory. I think that, that that death's door is a time portal. And I think that when I step across it, I'm gonna 
look around and my departed loved ones who have already stepped through that door are going to be stepping into that day as well at the same time. And then we're all going to look around at each other. Hey, how you doing? How, how come you're coming today? You had plenty of years left on you. Right? And then some of them are going to say, who are you? And they're gonna, others will say, well, this is your great, great, great grandson right here. And, and, and mine are going to be saying, I, but I don't know where he come from. You know, anyway, I don't know. There's something like that, you know. <laughs> but, whatever they sound like, you know. Um, but uh, it, it, but it, this is going to be a great reunion day. And it'll be joyful just, I mean, if, if, if you think that being reunited with your loved ones that have passed on is going to be a joyful thing, what about those who, if the Lord would la make it last a little longer, those who are going to come later on in your line. You know, if, if he was to hang around a little bit longer and you had grandkids and great-grandkids that you never really got to see in this life, but on that day you did? You ever prayed for them? You ever prayed for their salvation in advance before they get a chance to breathe? Yeah. You prayed for the unborn children that they would receive salvation, that they would grow up into that? I have certainly done that often. Uh, anyway, putting that all out there. We don't grieve as those who have no hope. Because why? We have the hope. And Paul is reminding the reader here, you have the hope. You're not one of those that doesn't have the hope of this. You have this hope. So your grief is going to be for, yeah, you're going to have grief. Sure, that's part of the process. Loss. You're going to feel the loss. They don't. They don't feel it. They're not going, oh, I wish I could go back and be with them. They're like, hey, you leave me alone. I'm here already, right? Oh, actually, I think they're going to be stepping across at the same time, like I said. But, you know, they, if, if there was such a, a time of them, them being approached and say, would you like to go back? Uh -uh. Don't, don't even be wishing them to come back. You know, you might be missing them, but they're the ones that are better off. You know, just look forward to the time when you get to join them. Right when there, there's a great reunion there at that time. Um, so anyway, in case you have had the idea that becoming a Christian meant that you would see the Lord's return in this lifetime, okay, some of us have been taught that. It's a good idea to have that expectation. Go back a couple thousand years and imagine you're in Thessalonica in the 60s AD, right, 50s. 60s, somewhere around that time, time period. Imagine you're there and you're a new Christian and you're like, oh, we've heard the gospel of the Lord and you come to faith in Christ. You thought that it's very highly possible, and, and in fact, you probably thought it was going to happen that you would be resurrected, that you, it, you would be caught in the rapture of the church before you died, that you wouldn't even see death. Right? You probably thought that. It's a good expectation to have. It's living knowing that it could happen. It could. I'm expecting the Lord to redeem me from this any moment, any time. That's a good expectation. Now, there were things that in, were in prophecy that needed to be fulfilled yet at that time. But as time has gone on, these prophecies have been fulfilled. Now, 2,000 years later, almost... We're in a time where most, where everything, I believe, that has to be prophecy fulfilled before the day of the Lord's return to take us out, I believe it's all happened already. And there's nothing left standing in His way, and it could be today. It could very well, uh, uh, from someone who's studied end times prophecy, I believe it could be today. It could be any time now. Now, does that mean that if you're left behind, if I, if I get raptured up and some of us get uh, the churches completely empty, I don't mean as empty as it is during this, this uh, China virus scare, but I mean like, uh, you know, really empty, like all the Christians are gone, and you were left behind, and you're like, what happened, you know? Uh, if that was to happen, the resurrection for us has happened, but the day of his return isn't yet. Does that mean that you can start your watch right then and say seven years from today, it's going to be the Lord's return? No. 
Because nothing in prophecy says that the seven-year period starts the day of the rapture. It doesn't say that. It, it, I think it, it would be a good trigger for the events to line up. But it could be a week later, it could be a month later, it could be years later. There's nothing saying it has to come right after that. But there will come a time where you could set your clocks to a, a time period that has started. And will you know that it has happened? I don't know. If you, if you can read the, the events that unfold after that, you would. But I'm speaking to those here today who have the hope of the resurrection because you're in Christ and your faith is in Christ and you're not worried about that the events that are going to unfold in the time of the tribulation because you're looking forward to your redemption, to your time of your resurrection. Resurrection day, that's what we're looking forward to. When we will be reunited with the Lord or united with the Lord in our case because we haven't physically seen Him yet. But those who did see Him will be reunited with Him on that day. That's when it will, when it will happen for us. So. In case that you, you, you were looking for his return and you haven't seen it and you're worried about those who have died, oh, they missed it. They don't get to go in that. Yeah, they do. God's the God of time. It hasn't happened yet, right? If your loved ones have passed away, they don't miss the harvesting of the people because they passed away. And there were those who were afraid of that. Oh, no. My loved one's going to die and miss the rapture and miss the resurrection because they're not alive. Well, that's bad teaching to say that you have to be alive when it happens. Because, and that's why Paul writes this letter. Because some had been taught that that was the way it was going to go. And you just miss it if you die. Well, that was bad teaching, right? So that, that's what he's telling them. In case you have that idea, no. Uh, those Christians who have died before his return, they won't miss out. Um, when he returns, he will bring them and us with him. Now, uh, there's, there's a multiple statement that's being made in that verse 14 there. Because he's going to, when he returns to the world, now that's a message to Israel and to all those uh, who are left behind on the earth and were not raptured out and taken away. Those who are in Christ will be with him when he steps foot onto the earth and returns. We will come with him. What does that mean? That means somehow he harvested us prior to being seen by everyone. Okay? Somehow he harvested us up and we are with him because we come back with him. Right? So you're following me on that. So the rest of the world doesn't have hope. They don't have any hope for the life after death, only eternal separation from God because they have not placed their faith and their trust in Christ. But we're not like that. And we pray that they will see the light before they pass as well. Uh, so when our loved ones in, the, in Christ pass away, we know that we will see them again in the resurrection and be with them and the Lord for eternity from that point on. Now, let's look at verses 15 and 16. According to the Lord's word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Catching all that? When will the dead in Christ be raised? First, when the Lord comes to call them up. When the Lord comes down from heaven with a loud command, the voice of the archangel, and the trumpet call of God. Now as you read the unfolding things that are happening in the Revelation, there's a point where you get past the letters and all that, the events that John saw unfolding, and there was a trumpet blast that went out. Okay, It's a little cryptic then in John's thing, but that's this. That's when this has happened. Okay, Anyway, the trumpet call of God will happen. He will come down. This is not the second coming. 
there is still the second coming event. Now you might say, well, it's all kind of part of that same event. It is, but it's separated by a, a time of the Holy Spirit being taken out of the world, all hell break loose, and God pouring out His wrath on sinners and Israel. Punishment of Israel. That is the reason the last half of that seven years is referred to as the time of Jacob's trouble. Jacob, the Jacob in the flesh, not Israel, the spiritual man. You see, there was, there was like a new birth for the man Jacob when God renamed him Israel. But when, it's when Scripture refers to him, you'll notice that when you're looking in the Old Testament, a lot of times when the Lord refers to the man Jacob, if He calls him Jacob in the verses, He's talking about his flesh nature. When He tries to do stuff out of His own power, His own strength and all that. But when He calls him Israel... And he's not talking about the nation. He's talking about that one man. and Because he, he renamed him Israel, right? And he was the father of the 12 tribes and all that. When he renamed him and when he refers to him as Israel, when Israel does this, when Israel did that and everything, he's talking about the new man that he empowered and the man who operated in the Spirit, by the Spirit of God. And it's kind of funny that, to, to notice that. There are times when God in Scripture calls him Jacob and there's times when he calls him Israel. Even after he renamed him Israel. He still sometimes called him Jacob. And one of these events, the time of Jacob's trouble, is the fleshly, the fleshly Israel nation. Jacob, uh, the nation Israel that's in the flesh, that's secular, that isn't following God and hasn't listened to the Spirit will have the wrath poured down upon them and punishment. Now, not all of the children of Israel, not all of the Jewish nation um, are secular Israel. Many came to trust and faith in Christ, their Messiah. He was sent to them. His own received Him not. That's not a blanket statement because some did. Some did, and that's how the church started. Those Jewish people who came to faith in Christ started the church, right? So there's a difference. There's the flesh or the secular, and then it's the, those in the spirit who are different uh, and are empowered by the Holy Spirit. So, time of Jacob's trouble is a time of God's wrath being poured out on earth. Now, I don't believe by my theology and by my interpretation of end times events, we call that eschatology, right? End times events. I don't believe that we will be here to be on the earth to, to, receive, to see that happening. Um, we'll be in the balcony, in the mezzanine. You know, we'll, we'll be with the Lord uh, during that time when that is happening. Personally, I think that that's the marriage supper of the Lamb, the wedding banquet, and all of that kind of stuff that's referred to in Scripture. I think that's what's happening while all hell is breaking loose on the earth. So... You know, we'll see, because we'll, we'll, we'll be there to see it, right? Aren't you looking forward to that? Uh, so anyway, uh, he will come down. It's not the second coming because he isn't on the earth, but in the air. Uh, verse 17, when we get there. He will come here in the air, but not technically onto the earth. And that, that comes later. And it's a little technicality, but it's there in the verses, right? Some people try to say that in the air is and they hyper-spiritualize this and will go to meet the Lord in the air, they say that that's now and that's because the kingdom is in the air now. He's all around us. He's here. His spirit is here in the world. And so we've gone to meet the Lord in the air. And we've already. And when He comes back, we'll go out to meet Him like a returning king from conquest. Uh, and that's how we'll... But that's not coming with them. That's going out to meet him when he gets here. There's a, see, I see all kinds of trouble with that. But there are people that, that try to argue that. Why would there be such confusion? Because we have an enemy that likes to confuse the saints. And according to what we're learning from Paul in this letter, Paul is trying to encourage us with his words, with these words. They're supposed to be encouraging. If it was the way the others try to say it meant it's going to happen, I would not be encouraged by these words. I would be very discouraged if I thought the other way was true. I'd be like, well, there's nothing to look forward to in that. 
There's also no doctrine of imminence. I'm not eagerly expecting it any day because I'm just waiting for the events to happen. Then I'll set my stopwatch. And I'll know exactly when the day is. Until then, I'm going to party on, Garth. Right? Might as well, because it's not going to happen yet. No, I think his, his followers are supposed to an anticipate his return coming soon and we're to serve him as if it's any day now and we're trying to make the most of every opportunity and all the time that we have left. So, those who have passed from this life will, be, will rise like Jesus did and will be in their eternal resurrected bodies first. First means before something else. Right? I, I, I know you think, duh. Why is, he, why is he saying that? First means before something else. We're talking about events. We're not talking about uh, um, in order of prominence. Firstborn status of, of, of a child, of a son, the firstborn son and everything, doesn't necessarily mean the one that was born first. The firstborn status was given sometimes to one of the others. And God or the father in, the, in those stories called somebody else his firstborn. Like Jacob. He referred to and he considered Joseph his firstborn. But Joseph was number 11. Right? He had 10 older brothers. Uh, you know, he, he was the firstborn of his mother. The one that Jacob dearly, dearly loved. Uh, out of his four wives, you know, but um, he was the one that was considered firstborn status. Well, Jesus wasn't the first baby to be born into this earth, right? But he is still the firstborn. He's God's firstborn. He's God's one and only begotten son, right? So, so firstborn and first sometimes means something other than a timeline. But here we're talking our subject line, our context of the story we're unfolding here is talking about what is going to happen in a future event. So the context here is timeline. So the word first here is talking about an event that happens before another event. Now, you, now you understand why I took a minute to explain that, right? Uh, because it's not just the more important event because it's really not the more important event it's part of the same thing like a coin has heads and tails it's still that same coin right it's like love the lord your god with all your heart all your mind all your soul that's a but tails b side of a record right is love your neighbor as yourself it's the same command love is that same coin well it's the same thing here the resurrection day has the resurrection of the saints and the catching up of those who are alive. It's all the same day, like a coin has two heads. Or, I mean, two sides. <laughs> heads and tails, you know. But it, you know could be a two-headed coin, but you better never bet tails if you have one of those, because uh, everyone argues, oh, I want heads. No, I want heads. Okay, so those who have passed from this life will rise like Jesus did and will be in their e eternal resurrected bodies first, before what before what is coming next verse all right let's look at verses 17 and 18 after that we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the lord in the air and so we will be with the lord forever Therefore, encourage one another with these words. This story, this, this address that's given is supposed to encourage us. If I was to believe the unfolding of eschatology the way some people try to explain it, I would not be encouraged. If it's already happened and I don't get to be a part of it, the story of how it goes on wouldn't encourage me at all, would it? encourage one another with these words. And they might say, oh, well, he's talking to people that lived before 70 A.D. Because some people say in 70 A.D. when they sacked Jerusalem and when that, that happened and, and a lot of Jesus, all of that discourse when he talked a lot about what's going to happen in the future for Jerusalem 
and let all oh, the women are breastfeeding let them run to the hills you know because you're not going to be able to refrigerate the you know or whatever I don't know that there's lots of warning and then you know and you're going to run for the hills when they when you hear this is happening well that happened in 70 AD a lot of that stuff happened it was a really a bad time and it could be considered a time of Jacob's trouble because it happened in Israel's capital Jerusalem when it was sacked by the Roman soldiers and they really tore it up. They tore up the temple. Then not one block was standing on another. They tore the whole place apart. They even went out and the fields surrounding sowed salt into the, plowed salt into the ground so nothing could grow for a millennium. It was desert around that area for hundreds and hundreds of years. It's not anymore. <laughs> it's a very fertile land again. And a lot of produce for that whole region of the world comes out of Israel. Pretty interesting the way God's put it all back together now. But they did have a time out. They had quite a time out as even being a nation. But they are a nation again. Great. We're glad for that. They're one step closer to understanding and receiving their Messiah than those who didn't even have God at all. So we're very grateful that they are gathering back together. And they are God's people again. But... That is not, the events that unfolded in 70 AD were not all, they did not fulfill all of the things that were forecast that would happen. Especially in Daniel's prophecy, you know, and uh, not even all of Jesus, all of that discourse. And you have to understand, when Jesus was talking about the events that happened, some of those events, same kind of thing is going to happen again. In the area, is, is there Jerusalem again? Yeah, it's rebuilt now. Is there a temple for them to sack again? Not yet. There will be before they do that. But that isn't required to be done before the church can be raptured. That's going to be done during the things that will require the temple will happen during the seven-year time of alleged peace before all hell breaks loose. You know, but they'll, they'll need a temple built then. But they don't need it for the, for the taking away of the saints. So yeah, there's no temple there right now. But there is a city. And it is their capital. Even though some countries may not want to recognize it because they decided that they were going to tell Israel where their capital was and build their embassies over in Tel Aviv. Israel said, no, our capital is Jerusalem. Why are you doing that? Well, there's a good airport over there, I guess. Well, okay. You know, ever since the, you know, the 50s when they were putting it all together, that's, that's been the place. But we didn't want it to be there, they say. We wanted it to be Jerusalem. Finally, our country has said, okay, we'll go along with that. We'll put our embassy in Jerusalem, like, like where you guys would like it all to be. And we now have a new embassy in Jerusalem. Isn't that cool? We kind of led the way on that. Um, and we should. We should be friends of Israel, I, I say. So, anyway, these words... That, that, that Paul gave us here, verses 17, after that, after what? After those dead in Christ rise from the dead. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them. Caught up together. They will rise from the grave, materialize, so to speak. Ashes become, you know, human form. Whatever, you know, up from the seal give up its dead. All the, you know... Wherever they happen to be buried, their, their atoms are spread out all over the place. You say, what about someone that was just annihilated in an atomic explosion or something like that? What are they, you know, why, why do we have to explain all that stuff? Is God not big? You know, God can gather that person back together from wherever. Does he even need the same molecules? No. He, can, he knows their DNA code. He can recreate them. You don't think God's got everybody's DNA in memory? He could just say, oh, that, that one's back together now. And just, in fact, all of them are back together now. All of them that are in Christ, in me, right? He can do that. He's pretty awesome. That will happen. They will come back and, and, and materialize back into being. And then we who are alive at that moment with them will be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Some people who argue against the rapture taking place say 
that the clouds isn't there in the original translation and all of that, and that the word caught up just means taken. We'll be taken. Taken by what? We'll just be taken to be with him, right? In the air, the air that surrounds him. Well, then how can that be a future event and be the here and now as well? You know, there's just so many holes in that theory. I, I don't get along with it very well, as you can see. I don't, I don't like that one. And, and I have no hope in that one. It robs me of my hope of this event, of being united with them in the air and having a time out of this world and a hope to not have to suffer the wrath of those days that are to come. Because we're not appointed to wrath, Scripture says. There's lots of Scriptures that talk about how His people would not be appointed to wrath. Talking about the Lord's, the Jesus' people. Not talking about God's people, Israel, because they are appointed. The nation is appointed to wrath, judgment. But we are not. I would have no hope thinking when I read about the things that happened during the seven years, the time of Jacob's trouble, Daniel's 70th week, all these things, all the troubles that are going to happen on this earth, I would not be encouraged thinking that I had to live through that. I'm not encouraged knowing that I have to live through what's going on right now. <laughs> right? This is kind of feels like hell on earth to me these days. But this isn't nearly what it will be. This is a taste of it. Oh, they're going to take our churches away. Yeah, they're trying to do that right now, aren't they? All over California. Oh, their scare tactics are all over the place. You're going to be arrested and thrown in jail for up to a year if you go to church. Who would do that? Who other than Satan himself would threaten the saints of God with if they gather together to worship him, they'll be thrown in jail for a year? That's third world country stuff. That's the kind of thing that happens in other places that we get all up in arms and roar about. Like, that's unjust. You can't do that. That's religious persecution. We have rights in this country, and, and we have an amendment to those rights that was supposed to guarantee the freedom in saying that Congress would make no law establishing a particular religion, nor get in the way of the free exercise of one. Right? So they don't get in our way, and they don't establish a religion. They would just stay out of that. They're here for laws and governing, right? And you might say, well, that's right, and Congress didn't make this law. That's right, they didn't. Some person elected to a position just commanded it. Great king overlord. A command, you can't have church anymore. You think this is something. It's going to be even worse during that time. It's going to be even way worse than that. Not only will you not be able to buy or sell anything without putting a mask on first, like you have to now, you're not going to be able to buy or sell anything without swearing allegiance and taking a mark that shows on your forehead or your hand that... Uh, you have sworn allegiance to this new leader of the world. You'll have to do that before you can buy or sell anything. And you won't be able to go to church. And there's all kinds of stuff like that. You think that your rights are being taken now. It's going to be worse during that time. I'm not going to be here for that. I would not be encouraged thinking I had to go through that. But Paul writes words here to encourage us. Encourage one another with these words. Here's some encouragement for you. If you're in Christ, there's a day coming where you're going to be taken out and you won't have to suffer what's to come. That's the great hope that we have and what Paul gave us of this. Let me read a parallel passage in a different letter. Right? You say, well, this is the 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 account of it, but isn't it somewhere else in the Bible too about this harpazo, the catching away? Yes, I'm glad you ask. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 51 through 53. Read as I, as I uh, read it here. Follow along. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a flash in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet for the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, 
and we will be changed. For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality. See, he was telling the Corinthians about the same event. He's using different words. He's describing it slightly different. And that, you know, why would it be described slightly different for different people? Well, they're different people. They had different customs around them, and they had different concerns than the Thessalonians did. Thessalonians were worried about one thing. The Corinthians were worried about a little something, different twist on it. Okay? Different people. Why are the Gospels all telling the same story, but they all tell different events? They were told from different points of view. You know, one, one person told it from their point of view, another one tells it from their point of view, right? But they all tell about the same man, and they all line up. They don't contradict each other, as some people try to say. They really don't. Okay, so, don't give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but all the more encouraging one another as you see that day approach. And that's what we're told in Hebrews 11.26, right? We're supposed to encourage one another. Paul's doing his job from the grave here with the letter that he wrote to us. He's encouraging each of us with these words. So I'm giving you the encouragement. My interpretation of this might be different than some. I'm not alone, though. There are many, many, many pre-trib rapture people like myself that are out there, uh, theologians that teach this exact same thing. Many teach it the same way and, and understand it the same way. Some have just been told that that's the way it is and they just accept it as that. Others of us have actually studied the verses and looked it up and still come to this conclusion. And, and um, so I have a little more respect for those who study it and come to a conclusion than those that just, oh, I was taught this. All right? Study it. Come to your own conclusion on it. But I'm telling you, if you want the encouragement, this is the encouraging way. This is very encouraging. So the dead in Christ will rise from the grave in imperishable bodies and in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, we will be changed into our new imperishable bodies, as 1 Corinthians 15 said. Uh, and together with the resurrected saints, we will be caught up in the clouds to meet our Lord in the air. So note again that he didn't step foot back on the earth in that scenario. Okay? But he appeared in the clouds as he calls us up to meet him. This is not the second coming, which is referred to ob often. Um, and previously where uh, we will be with him when he returns in his second coming. This is talking about an event prior to the second coming. So... Um, we might say, well, it's the second coming for us. Well, yeah, okay. <laughs> it is, but it's not that when he comes back to rule, second coming of Christ, where all will see him around the world, where he'll step down and the earth will split in half under his feet, right? You know, and there's a fault line that goes through the Mount of Olives where he ascended, you know, where they were told, hey, why are you looking up in the clouds? The same Jesus that just ascended before your eyes is going to come down in the same way. So I think it's going to be the same spot. Same footprints, I believe. And there's a fault line that goes through that hill. So the earthquake <laughs> spreads apart. You know, it's all lined up. God planned it all from the beginning. And he's got control of it. He's got the whole world in his hands. Not, not Atlas. God does. Right? All right. So, um, so keep on loving others. Abstain from the immorality. Grow in your love for one another. Stay out of other people's business where it's only being busybody, but take care of your own business, not being a burden on others, but a blessing. All the things that we're taught here in chapter 4, right? As, as chapter 4 is, is, comes to an end here. Then keep the hope of resurrection in your mind, expecting His trumpet to blast at any time now. There isn't much time left. So, how does that make you feel about those who don't yet have a saving faith in Jesus. Mm. They need one, right? Yeah. So what are you going to do about it? All right. How will you spend this time? Selfishly or selflessly? That's the question. But encourage people with these words. These are words you can tell people about this thing that's going to happen. Read it to them from Scripture. They reject it all. They reject it all. Rather, but they just might be brought to faith in Christ or at least 
through these words say, I want to be a part of that. I don't want to be a part of the other. Okay, well, I'm not saying going around and scare people into salvation. I'm, but I'm saying, you know, as they're worried about, is this the end? Is this the end? Fields are white, ready to be harvested right now. You know, I know that's something that uh, Greg Laurie would say in the harvest ministries down south. And fields are ripe white for harvesting. It's a great time for that. Everybody's afraid. You can give them hope. You can tell them how they can be encouraged with these words. We have a little taste of what it's going to be later, but this it'll be much worse than what we have it now. So, all right. With that in mind, let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the encouragement we get here. We thank you for the opportunity that we have to still be a part of this time here on earth where we might be able to share our faith and our trust in Christ with those who are not yet of the believing group, Lord, the ones who would be left behind if they don't come to faith in Christ. Lord, help us to be able to do it and say the right things at the right time when you open the opportunities for us. Help us to see it. And help us to not be misled that sometimes when we think it's an opportunity, but it's not. Help us use your Holy Spirit guidance so, and the wisdom from that so that we do it right, so that we don't turn people off, but yet we do offer hope. And I thank you for all these words that you give. I thank you for the people that you've given um, to us, the church, and thank you for the hope you've given us of that day of being reunited with all. And with these things, all these things that we thank you for, we say these things through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And everybody said, Amen.